dog may lessen just not bothering to plan? That's a question for teflologists. When I read this book, it's better to skim or scan. That's a question for teflologists. Can you be a good teacher if you have a Celta? Or should you invest in an MA or a Delta? From politics to methodology, we'll discuss them all on Teflology. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to Teflology, a podcast about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self-certified Teflologists. Good, yeah. Tefl cultures. Today's Tefl culture is Freecon. Have you heard the term <laughs> Freecon at all? Freecon. Freecon. In the Missy Elliott sense of the... Not in the Missy Elliott sense, but... Free, <laughs> free, free conversation. Free conversation, yeah, yes. Right. Yeah, so freecon means free conversation. Um, it's a phrase that I first encountered when I came to Japan to work in a, an Eikaiwa school, an English conversation school. Yeah. Um, and this was something that people said, uh, mainly uh, when you were preparing for a one-to-one lesson. Mm. Uh, people said, oh, this student, um, they like doing freecon. Right. 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 Uh, free conversation. And then other teachers would say, get your free con. Yeah. Yes, that's <laughs> where it comes from. Yeah. yeah. Um, and a lot of students, especially those who had reached quite a good level mm. uh, of English, mm. were given free con lessons. Um, sometimes they requested to have free con lessons. They'd speak to the teacher and say, I just want to talk. Mm. Um, and sometimes the teachers would do it just because they felt they could get away with it without having to so plan. That's what Free con means just talking. Just talking. Okay. Yeah, free conversation. Kind of unplanned, just conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, the student comes into the room, and the student and the teacher have a chat about some general topics. It's usually, you know, how did your week go, and then you move from there. Just a, a conversation, essentially. Are there kind of like high and low versions? Like, I mean, do, do some teachers occasionally provide a bit of instruction or correction, or the idea is you don't do any of that? Uh, there isn't really an idea behind yeah. it. This I is the thing. It's it's a very yeah. informal. I uh, think in its purest thing. sense, it's it's just having a chat with just someone. Talking, exactly. It's just talking, it's yeah. Not, it's not um, supported by anything, really. Yeah. Um, this was often, yeah. particularly with uh, floating students, they were called floating students. They were students who didn't have a regular teacher. In, in the yes, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so what they did was they just booked a time and they came in and whoever was available taught them. Mm. And often you'd, you'd get the progress sheet and, it, you know, all of their previous lessons, it said, you know, what did you cover? It just said free con. Yeah. 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 Um, and with those students, you did free con. Mm. Um, So it's often seen as kind of a lazy approach for teachers to take, probably correctly. (laughs) But a lot of students request it. So um, I was thinking perhaps today we could talk about why students request it um, and why uh, or what are some of the positives and negatives for students and for teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So first, from the teacher's point of view, perhaps, I've thought of a few positives. Maybe you can think of some of your own. Um, So the first good point of doing a free con lesson is it's easy. There's no preparation time, no planning time, no materials development. Yep. It's very easy. Yeah. yeah. I imagine most Eikaiwa teachers, when they see that it's a free lesson, are quite pleased. Yeah. yeah. Over the moon. I'd, <laughs> I'd maybe disagree with that a little bit. I, th- I think it's quite difficult to mm. have a conversation. Yeah. It depends what the learner level is, but to keep a right. conversation for an hour when you're expected to kind of ask the questions, yeah. keep it going, that's, that's kind of... Depends a lot on the student. Yeah. yeah. It could that be was quite saying, tiring. That was my, my sec- That was my first uh, negative point, actually. Right. It's, it can be boring. Yeah. And um, yeah. especially I, I found a lot of the time students would come in and say they wanted a free con lesson, but they would expect you to do all the work, mm-hmm. which is very difficult, you know, to just keep up conversation mm-hmm. for an hour. Mm-hmm. And if you have, like, three of those lessons in a row, that's three hours of just trying to chat with people yeah. in a foreign language. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's quite difficult. Did, when, like, having done similar stuff, a mm. lot, of, a lot of it though. It, yeah. I think it made me a slightly better conversationalist in English. Mm. I was never very good at, like you know, just small chat. But yeah, yeah. kind of oh, okay. learn techniques how to just ask. You know, right, types right. Of, like I, I, I'd go to parties or social events mm. and ask people the types of questions that I asked my students because I didn't know what else to ask them. Yeah. <laughs> like, like what? Like I don't know. You know, just stuff like you know, where are you from? Oh, okay. Yeah. About just your keep, it, keep it going. And, yeah. 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 Yeah, try to keep the ball in the air. Yeah. Do yeah. you think that some students? Well, this is a this is a question beyond this, I guess. But do you think some students like to be entertained? Uh, they try, they kind of go to the classroom to be asked questions and just yeah. perhaps yeah. 
Well, I it's think not just free content. that might be another might be another one of your your advantages. Mm. Maybe this idea that's you know it's very low pressure for the students, they, and so they're very relaxed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I'll, I'll, I've got some student perspectives mm. to talk, uh, um, but I'll finish the teacher perspectives <laughs> first. Um, so perhaps another positive point for teachers is that it's very interactive. You get mm -hmm. to know the students on a personal level, mm -hmm. and also a fun part of it is that students kind of treat it like a therapy session quite often. They tell you all these secrets about their mm -hmm. company and about their mm -hmm. personal life and yeah. all these scandalous things, and that's great. You know, you, yeah. you learn very interesting stuff. Well, especially it's a safe there. place, the classroom. Yeah. 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 Yes. There's yeah. no teacher-student confidentiality. But no. no, but they kind of assume there is. Yeah. Who, who are you going to tell? You know? <laughs> yeah. um, but perhaps a downside of that, something that I found, was that you, you found out things about your students that you sort of didn't want to know. Uh -huh. So, for example, I had a student who I really, really liked, um, but through free con lessons I found out, A, he hated the Chinese, right. which was not... So, I, I mean, I can't really continue a conversation in in that case, because I don't hate the Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a bit difficult to, you know, you can't be rude and, you know, just, so you just have to change the subject. And that's yeah. a bit weird. Yeah. Um, he also told me about how he used to take his dog around and try and kill cats. Hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you find out things that you perhaps wouldn't want to know but about your students. in that case, would you, would you focus on the language point or would you... Um, right. I, I thought the whole point was that you, you never yeah, focus you don't on focus language, language points. points. Yeah, well, I mean, if, yeah. Okay, so, I mean, there's a couple of things that this leads into, perhaps mm. we'll talk about that later. Maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think a, 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 another potential negative point is that it makes teachers who, who want to be professional about their job, it makes them feel a bit less professional because... For, for me, I sometimes felt, you know, I, I could be anyone. Anyone could be sitting here. You know, I don't need training to be doing this. Don't need to be yeah. a teacher. Don't need to be a teacher, exactly. Mm. Um, so I, I think that that's one of the downsides. It can make uh, teachers feel a bit less like professionals and a mm. bit more like, you know, dossers, yeah. essentially. <laughs> Which some teachers might like, I don't mm. know. Mm. Yeah, so those are some of the perspectives from the teacher's viewpoint. Um, for students, mm -hmm. again, I think there are some positives. Uh, so I think it's more interesting than a straightforward grammar focus lesson, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, you can just chat. You can find things out about your teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can have, um, you can have the feeling of being a language user mm -hmm. as opposed to a language learner. You know, you're actually in there in a situation where you're communicating with someone on a fairly level playing field. And the teachers should know how to grade their language to a level that's appropriate for you. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think it gives you the feeling of being a language user, which is potentially more authentic and more motivating, I would say. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From a, like, a teaching kind of theory perspective, like free conversation is, is meaning focused, isn't mm. it? Pure, it's purely meaning focused. Yeah. There's no form or anything that's focused on at all. And if, if the language is well graded, then it's it's a lot of comprehensible input. It's a lot yeah. of comprehensible input. What I find with FreeCon as well is a lot of vocabulary comes out of it. Yes. A lot. And you, you write down these words on the board. Oh, this word is good. You write that yeah. down and then they write it down. But they're not they're not really going to learn it or take no. it on if, unless the teacher makes a point yeah. of yeah. Yeah, yeah. focusing on it. Well, I, th I think that's the thing. Like, If, if you were to approach this in kind of a, a dogmate way, um, then yeah, this, yeah, you could yeah. be providing language at the point of need, right? Mm. Um, so when the students show a communicative gap, you can try and fill that gap with mm -hmm. something. But the problem is that because there's no structure, those things come up a bit too often mm -hmm. for the students to, you know, really take it on. In which case, they just write it down in their notebooks, which turn into yeah. uh, word cemeteries, to use Michael Swan's phrase. Right. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, yeah, as Dog may argue, conversation is is kind of the heart of heart of it all, isn't it? Yeah, that like conversation. But I, don't, I think a lot of teachers don't really know how to harness that conversation. Mm. Yeah. They'll just kind of speak and kind of forget their role as a teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, then you know, I, I think that's also you know well, I, what a lot of teachers like. Role as a teacher, mm. I guess, but yeah. yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting point about forgetting your role as a teacher. Because yeah. I used to teach lessons. That I, I wouldn't call them free time because they, they were, there was there was no predetermined language focus, but yeah. a lot of. Yeah. Um, structures or vo like this vocabulary would come out of it, and the students would leave the lesson with a bunch of structures and vocabulary. And stuff. Mm. Right, right. Yeah. Um, but it was like, I, but what would happen is if I get really engaged with the discussion, sometimes you know, 10 minutes go by and you realize you haven't paid any attention to any focus at all yeah. because you have kind of stopped teaching. We've got to teach. Yeah. yeah. I think, but again, I think some students might want that. Maybe, mm -hmm. like, um, so when I was doing the diploma, I remember they had, you know, these. Uh, uh, grammar lessons and then skill lessons. Mm. Um, I, 
could you could this be seen as a kind of extended skill lesson, an extended speaking practice turn? Mm -hmm. You know, whether the students are just practicing interacting with someone using mm -hmm. all of their stored linguistic knowledge, which maybe especially somewhere like Japan, those students haven't had a chance to use that for the whole week, and yeah. then they come yeah, yeah. in and it's yeah, their yeah, only exactly. chance to speak English all week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One one thing that you could argue is um, like the dog may approach attempts to uncover a syllabus. Yeah. Rather than cover it, it uncovers mm. the syllabus. So yeah. you could argue that um, if all of this language that's coming out of the free conversation is documented somehow, yeah. you mm. could argue that you've covered a, a syllabus yeah, yeah. in yeah. that conversation. Perhaps. But I think that would be a, the, there's a problem there for the management of the schools because they, they have a syllabus that they want you to cover mm. because yeah. they want you to work yeah. through the book and then move the student on to the next level and work mm. through the book and move them up. And if you're doing it that way, which I think is probably a yeah. good way to do it, it's going to cause problems for them. That might be a reason why it's discouraged by a lot of the management in these schools. Yeah. I mean, I, I imagine it's discouraged maybe because they can't trust the teachers to... That's true. ...to know <laughs> what kind of language work is. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 But it, it also made me think, especially when you talked about it's usually done at a certain level, mm. was I think Krashen had this idea that maybe at the in, once you're at the intermediate level, students really don't need much focus on forms. Right. Um, that they, you know, j just... Um, using the language will be enough to kind of improve. Mm. What's that called? The comprehensible input. And it's kind of like noticing, right? Yeah, yeah. Also, and so it is. Yeah. So, but then there are there are all these ideas. Is how much do you help the students notice? Um, people who are against that kind of things, uh, you know, they cite a lot of research that says that if they're not, if there isn't any focus on form, mm. even at higher levels, their accuracy isn't going to improve. Yeah. But then, how important is accuracy if you know if they're communicating? Yeah. Yeah. It raises a lot of questions. It certainly does. So yeah. I think the I think a happy medium would be like kind of supported, free, theoretically underpinned, yeah. free <laughs> if that's possible. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's kind of an ideal way to do it. Mm. Um, but you know, again, one reason that it's a popular uh, approach—it's not really an approach, but <laughs> a, a popular way to teach—is because you don't have to you do, do that. that. Yeah, that's why teachers like to do it. Mm. Um, but I think, yeah, I think there are some positives and some negatives, and I can see why some students want to do it, I can see why some teachers want to do it, um, but, yeah, maybe it's important not to forget the, the principles of why you're doing it, mm -hmm. yeah. And that's today's TEFL Culture FreeCon. TEFL Pioneers. Okay, so when I say the words chaos, mm -hmm. off-task, mm -hmm. uh, off, yeah, I've got a weird way of saying that. Yeah. But, um, the <laughs> off, 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 off. <laughs> the, is there an R? <laughs> off the A U F. <laughs> the opposite to being on task. Uh -huh. And the words play. Um, these kind of throw up negative connotations for me um, from the perspective of the language teacher. Right. Because in our class, we we don't often we don't want chaos or play. We want the students to be on task and doing what we tell them to do. Mm. Yeah. Argument? In, Argument certain, in certain situations. Yeah. In certain situations, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, however, recent studies have shown that perhaps maybe we need a bit of chaos in our class. Maybe mm -hmm. we need a little bit of off-task um, time mm -hmm. in right. our class. And this introduces my pioneer today, uh, Mikhail Bakhtin. Mm -hmm. I think okay. I'm saying that right? Yep. Yeah, Bakhtin. I wouldn't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about, although he's not related so much to English language learning, perhaps very similar to Vygotsky. Uh -huh. mm. He's kind of been applied yeah. to the classroom. Yeah. So people have taken his ideas and applied them to the English classroom. Basically, yeah. Right. So that's okay. kind of why he could be regarded as a pioneer of sorts, Yeah. basically. So I'm going to talk a little bit about his life first. But a lot of his, a lot of his work was, has been regarded posthumously right. after his death. But his life is still important. <laughs> yeah. I just want to clarify that. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Michael Bakhtin was a Russian philosopher and scholar mm -hmm. whose work encompassed literary theory, ethics, and the philosophy of language, okay. which is perhaps in relation to this podcast. Right. Pretty much. Um, <laughs> he was born in 1895 mm -hmm. and died in 1975. Okay. okay. So yeah, quite Good a short, well, I'd say quite a short <laughs> life. Too. Oh, really? Uh, I guess at that 80, time. 80, 80 years old. It's not bad. It's not bad. I'd be so. happy with 80. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll be lucky to make it to 60. <laughs> okay. Um, so a lot of his popularity and interest came after his death, mm -hmm. actually. Posthumously. <laughs> Posthumously. Um, so at a young age, Bakhtin lived in the cities of Oyo in Russia. Uh -huh. Right. 
Vilnius, which is in modern day Lithuania, okay. uh, I believe. Where was it at the time? <laughs> where would Part it be, where would it be in the uh, in Russia at the time, I guess. Okay. Before the, in the, the Soviet US. Empire. Yeah, the Soviet yeah, Union. yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. Soviet Union. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not so important. <laughs> and um, he er, he before he moved on to Odessa, which is now part of Ukraine. Ukraine. Got some steps in it. That's right. And it was in Odessa where he had his first faculty position. Mm-hmm. Okay. Odessa. Odessa. <laughs> so it was perhaps during this time in Odessa that he first became influenced by the concept of the carnival. Right. <laughs> The what? <laughs> the ca- I'm saying carnival. Carnival. <laughs> carnival. 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 Yeah. The carnivalesque. That's an uh, easy right. way to say. Yeah. Um, have you heard of this concept or idea no. before? No. no. I've heard of a carnival, but not yeah. something. And the carnival. <laughs> a carnival. There's no carnival. In okay. okay, well, I'll, I'll talk about briefly what this means. So this refers to moments when traditional rules and order mm. are put aside. Mm. The world is turned upside down. And the routines of daily life are suspended. They're like a festival of fools. Yeah, kind of in that way. I guess. Right. A um, ship of fools. No, a festival of oh, fools. Fest- oh, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Another way to describe <laughs> it a, a topsy turvy muddling of the social order. Nice. Social order. That's interesting. It's a nice sound bite. Mm-hmm. So, this term comes from the carnival celebrations during which people in largely Catholic and perhaps medieval and Renaissance communities uh, mm-hmm. wore masks and had massive street parties. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, this is of relevance to his contributions to language, so I'll, I'm going to return to that later. Okay. This idea, apply that to the language okay. classroom. Put that in a drawer, listeners, and <laughs> bring it out later on. <laughs> Just to <laughs> set that up for you. Um, so in 1918, Bakhtin found work as a school teacher back in Russia, mm-hmm. he moved back to Russia, at which point he formed the Bakhtin Circle. The Bakhtin Circle. <laughs> <laughs> you can't end <laughs> Circle, a group where in- first. <laughs> not that sort of circle. A group where intellectuals debated things of the moment. So I, I think at that time it was a lot of to do with German philosophy. Right. They sort of discussed these existentialism issues. That kind of thing. Yeah. And then during the nineteen twenties, he got married. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is nothing to do with this. <laughs> the kind of less. It's a long ceremony. Good, good for him. <laughs> Something else happened in the 1920s. <laughs> um, he, he actually fell ill with a bone disease. So, jokes on years. <laughs> should we do that again? We should probably do that again. We, we should probably do this bit again. Are we putting all? Are we leaving this in? <laughs> this is saying yeah, definitely. <laughs> but in 1923, he had his leg amputated. <laughs> he had his leg amputated. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> okay, so he then moved to Leningrad. Okay. Um, I think that's still part of Russia. I believe even so. Even today. Yeah. Yeah. Briefly, um, Stalingrad. Mm. Oh, right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where he took up a position as a consultant for a state publishing house. Mm. Okay. But due to repressions of the time, a lot of his work at this time was lost oh. and, or not published until 60 years later. Mm-hmm. A lot of this after his death. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was also around this time that he developed another concept, the concept of dialogism. Right. Are you familiar with this? It's got something to do with dialogue, I guess. Right. Yeah, um, perhaps I won't talk about this so much today, but maybe in a later episode we can mm. return to this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Bacton was in prison for six years. Okay, what for? As a result of Stalinist purges okay. on artists and intellectuals, Rob. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and he spent this time in internal exile in Kazakhstan. Mm. Right. And he worked as a bookkeeper, mm. actually. Okay, so after his exile, he had a six-year exile. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bakhtin went on to gain a position at the head of the Department of Russian and World Literature at the Mordovian Pedagogical Institute mm-hmm. before retiring early due to ill health. Okay. Fair interesting enough. life. Yeah. It's a very interesting life. So today I want to talk about one of his concepts in particular and mm-hmm. try and apply it to the language classroom. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Yeah, as I mentioned before, the idea of the carnival Mm -hmm. and being carnivalesque. Mm -hmm. And Bakhtin talked about four concepts. Number one, a a carnival is familiar and free interaction between people. Mm -hmm. Carnivals often 
brought unlikely people together and encouraged the interaction and free expression of themselves in unity. Right. So this would be to do with the suspension of the social norms and rules. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And number two, eccentric behaviour. Unacceptable behaviour is welcomed and accepted in the carnival. Mm -hmm. And one's natural behaviour can be revealed without the consequences. Mm. Okay. There are, presumably there are limits to that. Though. I don't think there were. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I think it's more of a conceptual idea. Yeah. So obviously yeah, yeah. it was based on real carnivals, real festivals, but I think it's yeah. more conceptual. Right, yeah. because that, as I said, they have the Festival of Fools and that kind of thing. Mm. And they have the clowns of South America who go around right. destroying stuff. Yeah. Mm. And number three, the carnivalistic misalliances. So familiar and free format of carnival allows everything that may be normally separated to reunite. Right. Uh, for example, heaven and hell, the young and the old. Okay. And finally, number four, the sacrilegious aspect. Mm -hmm. So Bacton believed that the carnival allowed for sacrilegious events to occur without the need for punishment. Mm. Okay. Bacton believed that these kinds of categories are creative theatrical expressions of manifested life experiences in the form of sensual ritualistic performances. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. There's something Sounds very good. paganistic about this. I imagine mm. there would have been, yeah. I mean, I, it probably originated like most religious ceremonies yeah. originated in yeah. paganistic yeah. things. But it's, I mean, it's interesting that they survived and that, yeah. that you know, because Carnival, like you say, is strong identified with Catholic countries. Right, right. Sure. Yeah, but they so, maybe they identified this need to let people just let loose now mm, and again. Sure. So, yeah. so bearing in mind these four concepts, how do you think this could be applied to language teaching and language learning? Um, well, for example, I mean, I, I guess the, you know, um, upsetting the, the norms and uh, rules in the classroom, um, you know, the roles of the teacher and student and yeah, yeah. the other learners and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you could play around with that. Um, with the language itself. <laughs> Um, yeah, understand. Yeah. I guess may maybe at his time, especially this, it might have been quite radical. But this idea of, well, you know, first of all, moving away from prescriptivist, you know, yeah. views of, of how language works, mm. and understanding that native, so-called native speakers, don't speak correctly, you know, or yeah, yeah, yeah. follow the rules that we expect, we often expect learners to follow. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So just. Um, um, recognizing that they should also be allowed to play with the language. Yeah, yeah. well, um, yeah, like you mentioned, carnivals mock official rules, oh, sorry, mm. official roles and mm. discourses, mm. leading to a sense of familiarity. Mm. Mm. Right. When when they have these carnivals, I mean, that's a, a particular specified time. It's like a, a, a time mm. and a place where it's safe to do that. Do you, yeah. So is the classroom kind of like, um, a, I don't know, a safe space for students to, to play around with language and roles and that kind of thing? Well, that's that's it. a lot. A lot of carnivals obviously you need to place them in a contextual kind of socio-political setting. Yeah. Which in this case would be the classroom. Right. And obviously the power would be the teacher. Yeah. So, yeah, they they have a certain context that you have to consider. Right. Basically, um, for me, so it has a lot to do with language play. Uh, Guy Cook's idea of language play mm -hmm. that the classroom is a safe house. Right. Now, I, I talked about this in the previous podcast. Yes. Go back and listen to it. Um, <laughs> classroom is a safe house, and the idea that the, the classroom has kind of a play frame to it. Some some certain conditions, but there's a lot of flexibility with language play. Right. Um, Humour has also been suggested as lightening the cognitive load. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Basically, if students have the ability to have fun with something, to laugh, it, it lightens the learning burden, I guess. Right. So there could be developmental gains, arguably, from, from this opportunity for mm. carnival conditions in the classroom. Is this something that you'd want to be happening all the time in the classroom? Or is it something that you'd have, like a carnival, it only happens occasionally? Because, mm. um, you know, at, at certain times in the classroom, you do want some order and you do want, you know, um, a certain way of doing things, I feel. Well, yeah, so a couple of researchers, De Silva, Iddings and McCafferty, mm -hmm. 2007, say that you can apply Bactinian analysis to the classroom right. in the actions of learners during off-task moments, okay. in particular right, off-task right, right. moments, uh, believing these instances as not being detrimental but as transformative. Mm -hmm. So a, a dialogical process between self and other in relation to culture, history and real or imagined contexts. Okay. That's quite wordy. Yeah. But I think <laughs> what, what they're saying is don't see students playing around as something that's detrimental. Mm. Try and encourage the students to kind of manipulate the task in hand, perhaps. Right. And 
the fact that they're not doing a task means that it's too difficult for them. Mm. So if, if they have the opportunity to play around with it and manipulate it, yeah. learning will still take place. It might also mean that it's not relevant for them. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of the, uh, the example of when Kanagaraja talks about the students writing in their textbooks and changing the stories and things to, to suit their own personal uh, you know, situation. Um, perhaps that's yeah. another example of it. Yeah, so maybe you could tie in authenticity as well mm. to this as well. The fact that they're playing around with with the form, they're making it more authentic for themselves, perhaps. Right. Okay. So yeah, I, I very loosely tried to apply Michael Bakhtin to language learning, and I'm not the first person to do that. But I mm. think his certainly his theories can contribute to our field. Okay. So that's our TEFL pioneer today. <laughs> TEFL News. So this episode's TEFL News is, again, news in a kind of loose sense. Right. Um, okay. Kind of. It's, so it, there's a little bit of background, which is we have to go back to 2012. Okay. And uh, have either of you heard of um, Demand High? No. Is okay. that a person? <laughs> <laughs> Demand High. Um, Demand High. Demand High. So it's, uh, so and I'll, I'll explain it. I think it was the IA TEFL conference in 2012. Mm. Um, where Jim Scrivener and Adrian mm -hmm. Underhill first, um, in their words, launched Demand High. Mm -hmm. um, they're very clear that they call it a meme. It's not a method, it's a meme. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, and so, the, yeah, obviously the first thing to discuss is what Demand High is. Yeah. Um, so they, they provide a, a kind of a, a little kind of manifesto of, of what Demand High is. Mm -hmm. um, they had a few kind of statements. Um, so, uh, first one is, it's okay to teach. Right. Um, you have permission to be an active interventionist teacher. Okay. There's another one. Um, we need to focus on where the learning is. Mm -hmm. uh, work at everyone's pace, not just the fastest few students. Right. Learn the classroom management techniques that make a difference. Mm -hmm. Risk working hands-on with language. And finally, expect more. In other words, demand high. What do you mean by that first, it's okay to teach? Is that in response to, like, learner autonomy? Or yeah, so this is part, part of the background, the context for, for this, is that um, what they explained was that what they noticed, being teacher trainers, something they noticed a lot was um, a lot of lesson plans where teachers seemed to be, what they, they kind of described as going through the motions mm. of a communicative language teaching yeah. Me yeah. methodology yeah. or approach. Um, and that um, CLT has become so common and so widespread that people just kind of apply those um, principles mm. to lessons, but maybe just going through the... They, they describe yeah. CLT as, as hit, um, a cul-de-sac, basically. Right. Reaching a cul-de-sac where um, there wasn't maybe much creativity or thought behind what people were doing. Yeah. But doesn't that... Yeah. I mean, I, I'd have thought that's a lot of the blame for that lies at the foot of uh, teacher trainers, because like, when you're doing... Mm -hmm a certificate or a diploma course, that's what you have to do. You have to go through the motions. They actually have checklists of the motions <laughs> yes. for you to go through. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a fair okay. point. So actually, the, some of the... Why I include this in the news section is that recently, and may, maybe it's, it's been going on since 2012, I'm, I'm sure it has, but just in the last few months at least, there's also been a lot of um, blog posts about Demand High, right. um, both being critical of it and, and supporting it, but a lot more being critical of it. Mm -hmm. um, so again, th th maybe this idea of, of demand high is, yeah, the, the the demand high part, which maybe is, should be more of the focus or what they want to focus more on, is this idea that basically we can be pushing our learners to do more. Right. Um, the another thing they, they talk about is maybe we praise too much our students. Mm. Right. And okay. instead of praising them, we should be finding out how we can push them further. Right. To, so. In not letting them rest on their laurels. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and at the, at, I think at that IATEFL conference, it was Scrivener who introduced this, this meme. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Underhill gave a little demonstration about what, what they meant by right. demand high. And what he did was, unsurprisingly, some pronunciation work. Mm -hmm. And it was basically teaching some techniques, which I've seen him um, <laughs> present in... in in, in other contexts, okay. not a demand high context, but just as maybe um, good ways to teach pronunciation. Right, right. Um, so a lot of the, the criticism of demand high, as maybe you can imagine, is, I mean, things like you said, 
um, um, teacher trainers are maybe partly at fault. Mm. Yeah. Um, but also that, that, that this isn't really anything new. Mm. They're trying to package it as something new. Right. Um, yeah. But it's when you, when you actually look at what they're talking about, um, applying it to the classroom, it just seems to be talking about you know, what is good teaching. Right, right, it seems, right. It seems reactionary. Mm -hmm. I'd say more than new, reactionary to like this, like I said before, this idea of teachers are moving further away from their learners and yep. yeah, teaching, yeah. I yeah, guess. Yeah. You know, this yeah, idea yeah. of autonomy and mm. self-access. Mm -hmm. It's kind of saying that the teachers should be a bit more o overpowering, perhaps. A little bit more powerful. O overbearing. <laughs> right. Overbearing, yeah. 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 So some, some, def yeah, some defenders of demand high have seen have this idea that so now it, it's common. We don't call ourselves teachers. We call ourselves, you know, language learning facilitators or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Demand high is. I think that's 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 behind the "don't be scared to teach" idea. Yeah. Mm. But I mean, I, I think a lot of um, theory in uh, you know applied linguistics, mm -hmm. it it does lead to. All, I mean, you know, it. There's lots of ideas um, people put forward about like you know when you're teaching pronunciation, you just have to teach what's good enough for people to be understood. And when you're teaching grammar, you just need to teach what's enough for people to communicate, mm. you know, and I do sometimes wonder if those kind of, those ideas mm. lead towards situations where the students are being taught, you know, not in a very demanding way, you know, mm -hmm. they're being taught just enough to get by mm -hmm. <clears throat> right. and not, you know, perhaps higher level stuff. Yeah. yeah. What's the learner's role in demand high? Do they need to be taken on board by this? Do they need to know this is what we're doing here? Yeah, um, I, I wonder. It might um, not be an enjoyable right, task, right. but you've got to go along with it. I mean, I, I guess I guess the idea behind it is that if if the learners are being pushed, but they're also they also feel like they're improving, yeah, um, yeah. then that would be a, a motivating or engaging thing for them. Right. But again, it, it would depend a lot on the what, what it doesn't seem to take into account. And another criticism of it has been that well, actually, let me go back. One of the main criticisms is that. This is based on what Scribb and Underhill have claimed they've seen in a lot of language teaching. Right. Um, a lot of people, especially blogs, wrote, this isn't what I've seen. Right, um, right, right. Sure, there are you know, teachers who get lazy and just kind of go through the motions, mm. but um, it, it, it seems like a big presumption to assume that that's, that's where the industry suddenly found itself. Yeah, and I mean, this is really only looking at one part of the mm. industry, right? I mean, I'm assuming mm. the, the private language school part of the industry, as opposed to mm -hmm. most awesome. of the industry, which is taking place in other, in other right, right. sectors. Yeah, 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 I think so. Mm. Yeah. If, I, I don't think they're, they're basing their, this, um, this uh, supposition on having done an you know, a international survey on, on how right, language right, is right. being taught at the moment. Yeah. Um, another criticism is that as, as kind of names in the field, um, basically what they've done is they've, they've you know, branded themselves, mm. and then this means they can go to conferences and write books and, and all this stuff yeah. under this new, again, and they use the, the term meme, um, right, right. which a lot of people also are a little yeah, bit funny that about. Seems a little right, bit. Right. <laughs> I mean, even this idea of launching a meme, like an internet meme, mm. is, yeah. like, that's not how memes work exactly, usually. Old ones you don't seems similar yeah. to the, do the dog may movement of like 10 years ago. Just over ten years. Yeah, ago, except yeah. except that was I mean it's kind of the opposite because mm. that was um, a a bottom up thing you know that yeah, yeah. Uh, Scott Thornbury yeah. suggested the idea other people picked it up and ran with it whereas this it seems like a top down thing we've had this idea and we're going to turn it into a thing you know yeah, but yeah, they're, yeah. they're both reactionary mm, well yeah from different ends I guess yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. reacting to current trends or perceived current trends yeah. right yeah. so I mean Thor Thornbury's actually he's he's kind of come out and defended it a little bit just mm. in terms of that the basic idea behind it is sound. Mm. Um, that um, we always, I mean, but the basic idea seems to be that we always want to be improving ourselves as teachers, right. and then maybe here are some ways of doing it. Um, when when you do look at the, the demand high has its own um, website or blog and, and all oh, that kind okay, of stuff, right. and and there are materials and teacher training materials. Mm. Um, a lot of the language used around it also is, is sometimes it kind of comes across as corporate speak or right, you know, these right. kind of things where they're, they're trying to market things or sell things. This, you said this was a meme, but what are some of the methods attached to this? There's some of the existing approaches that, that this would use. Mm. Um, so it's uh, one idea is that it can be applied to any methodology or approach. Okay. And that maybe one of the things they often talk about is that it requires only possibly only small adjustments to things that you're already doing. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
again, this may be part of the marketing behind it. Like, you don't have to, you know, right, you don't right, have right. to completely re, um, rewrite the way that you teach, but if you just do a few small things. Mm. Um, mm. But I think maybe that idea, maybe the, if there is one main idea behind it, it is maybe this idea that we can teach more, mm. um, we can be a little bit more top down. Um, we don't have to be scared to be the providers of some kind of knowledge or information. Scared in to interrupt or scared to intervene. Or yeah, um, yeah. That's what you said. In, look, teachers have to be is it interventionists. Is yeah, we mm. mentioned. Yeah, or, yeah. or don't be scared. Don't be scared. Right. Interventionist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they they they've written a few in a few places about again this idea of praise that we don't just have to accept that what our students have done is great. We yeah. want to always be pushing them further. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think with the interventionist thing, I think it would be better if teachers were more surgically interventionist mm -hmm. in that, mm -hmm. like, a lot of the time, teachers just walk around monitoring constantly mm -hmm. and correcting constantly. Right. You know, um, and I sometimes think, just leave the students alone to get on with it. If they're doing their work, just leave them alone to go and do something else, you know. And, if and you know, monitor more sparingly mm -hmm. and only intervene when it's necessary. You know, uh, you know, don't intervene on every mistake. What's the point? I think Ellis, Ellis's idea, Rod Ellis's idea of you need to interact in flight mm. online, that idea of you need to tackle problems if there are any when the learners are in flight in task right, or right. doing something. Yeah. And yeah. Some other people have disagreed with that. That can sometimes, I mean, I, in my Japanese class, um, one of my teachers, every time I made a mistake, it was she'd correct it. And she just corrected by saying the correct thing over the top of what I was saying, sure, which was sure. really irritating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even you're trying to ask her a question and she corrects the grammar of your question while you're asking her the question. That's not helpful, you know? Yeah, yeah no, of course not. So I mean, I, and obviously Scrivener Underhill aren't talking about... No, 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 no sure, sure, They're sure. talking about, you know, very effective ways of doing these kinds of things. Mm. Um, so the, the, the feeling I get is that it's, you know, there are a lot of good ideas behind it and there's probably a lot of good little micro techniques that you can get out of it. Yeah. Um, a, the, the main issue people seem to have with it is the way it's being presented, right. is the way it's being marketed in a way. Mm. And when they say things like, we're launching a meme, yeah. it does sound like marketing. Right, right, right. right. Um, and maybe, so, maybe that's the way forward from now on, maybe. Well, that it, maybe yeah. it is. Um, or maybe that's what people are resisting, is that they don't, want, of, they don't yeah. want things yeah. to be that way. Right? Yeah. They don't right. want it to be that easily kind of boiled down. Right, mm. I see, yeah. Right. Should we launch a Teflology meme? <laughs> yeah, what could it... Uh... <laughs> I don't know. Oh. Teflology. Think big. Think big. Yeah, think big, act small. Yeah. <laughs> no. mm. So, anyway, that's today's... Uh... <laughs> Not today. Try that again. Yeah. So, anyway, that's... Yeah, you just said Tefl News. Yeah, so that's uh, Tefl News for this episode. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much for listening to today's episode. If you'd like to get in contact with us, please send an email to tefilology at gmail.com or you can follow us on Twitter at tefilology. Uh, also, please don't forget to rate, review and uh, tell your friends about the podcast because that does help the show a lot. So, uh, it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye. about that. <coughs> Nothing. <laughs> That's, who'd have thought that would be what would set us off? Bone disease, yeah. It's not funny, is it? We, we should probably do this bit again. <coughs> Let's go for during the 1920s. Yeah, yeah, I think we have to start okay. from... Do all this again. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay, so look, moving on to the 1920s. So he first got married. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, he fell ill with a bone disease. <laughs> okay, so during the 1920s, moving mm -hmm. on to the 1920s, yeah. he got married. Good. Congratulations. Yep. Uh, but unfortunately... Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's looking good. <laughs> we all backed in. Uh, it's the word unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you skip this? Just skip this bit. It's not important. <laughs> <laughs> what happened after he lost his leg? <laughs>
do that again. <laughs> we can put okay. some of this at the end, so it's not yeah, all yeah. lost. I'm going to just cut it down so that it's um, still funny. <laughs>